Hey, it's Norm from Tested.com here at GDC 2015. It's our second chance to look at Razer's OSVR. Now I'm joined by Chris Mitchell. You are the product marketing manager for OSVR. I want to chat about what this initiative is about. So, how are you doing? Good. How are you? Uh, doing great. So OSVR, it's a. It's, you guys want to be like the open version of other HMDs, virtual reality HMDs. Uh, kind of taking initiative on your yes. own to partner up with developers and hardware makers. That's right. Uh, so I want to talk about both the hardware and the software. Start with the hardware. You guys have a developer prototype yes, uh, that's shipping later this year. Um, and we saw it at CES, but you guys have made some changes. So what's new about this developer kit? Okay, so the biggest difference is probably the, uh, we, we replaced the panel that we had before. We had an IPS panel, so an LCD display. Now we have an OLED display, so that, that gives us a bit better color contrast, as well as um, a lower latency, thanks to like faster pixel switching of the OLED display itself. So that's probably the biggest upgrade um, based on feedback and our own findings uh, throughout. But other than that, we also added a face mask, so it's a a bit, a bit more comfortable to wear for an extended it's, period of time. Uh, um, and then uh, one unique thing that we announced about uh, um, the OCI GK is the dual lens system that you can adjust with using the knobs underneath, right? So you can adjust it to your interpupillary distance um, as well as depending on how, how visually impaired you are. Um, so we improved the mechanics for that so it, it stays in place a lot better. So overall a much cleaner and, and better experience with HGK and uh, thanks to the OLED display you get better visuals. Um, they were already pretty strong thanks to the dual lens system but yeah, that's even better now. So this headset, it, it, when we look at it, we shouldn't take into account like this. This probably isn't what the consumer, any consumer version, is going to be. It's for developers. That's right. And you're creating a hardware platform that's modular. Yes. So yes. what can people swap out? I mean, what what is the appeal for a developer to get your headset and to develop games using it? So as a game developer, the nice thing there is that it's it's just um, very versatile. So if you want to do uh, augmented reality, if you want to do virtual reality, if you want to do um, if you want to use positional tracking, like it doesn't matter what you want to use, right? Like uh, the HMD itself is very modular. More interesting though than for software developers, it is for hardware developers. So the, the idea with making everything open source about the HGK is that you can go in and build your own, you can add stuff to it yourself. So if you're a guy that develops um, motion tracking cameras, you could build a um, an add-on to the, the HDK that just fits in, it works with everything, and you have a proof of concept from the get-go. Rather than having to develop the whole thing yourself, you take the HDK, slot in your technology, you're good to go have a proof of concept. And what that allows you to do primarily is that rather than having business development decide on, on what technologies consumers will see in the long run, it's a technology itself because anyone can contribute, anyone can show off their technology and then compete on even terms with other ones That's and then let idea. the market decide. Yeah, you mentioned augmented reality. For yes. example, if uh, I was a game developer and you know there's this Oculus out there or if I want to develop for you know, Sony Project Morpheus, exactly. I'm kind of locked into either a PC or a mobile platform or a console. But augmented reality wouldn't be supported as of now. Yes. But with this kit, you can swap out the faceplate, so you lose positional tracking, for example. But then you can start developing augmented reality yes. dual dual camera systems. And in fact, those could be also combined. Right now, we we made two faceplates available over and above the standard one. One is an infrared LED one that is primarily positional tracking. Um, the other one is a um, dual camera, so an outward facing dual camera. So that can be used for both augmented reality, um, but also for positional tracking if you use slam algorithms or anything like that. So boy, you, you could also combine the infrared LEDs with the dual camera if you design that yourself. So the field is wide open really, and we're making everything available open source so people can, like developers can use what we're developing and, and can uh, build it from there, modify it, it's all all there for the taking really. From, from Razer's perspective, what is, what is the advantage here? Why make a system for an open hardware platform? Because you guys make laptops controllers, right. and this, you know, you can use a Leap Motion. Will right now is using a Bluetooth ring controller. That's right. You know, what's the idea behind this? So, for us, they, it, it's not entirely altruistic either. For we want to, in the first place, we want to get VR um, to actually be happening in an open, uh, open space. So, um, we've seen VR 
always being on on the brink of of consumer, but it's not quite there, and it's kind of been on the on the edge of getting there for a long, long time. So what we're trying to do is is kind of rally a lot of uh, the parts, like a large part of the industry, to rally behind the same goals, work together, and make it actually happen. And for us, the main interest then is in the peripheral space. That's what Raise has always been been uh, good at. That's where our expertise is. But um, there's not going to be a VR peripherals market unless there's a VR consumer market in the first place. So you're so. Really thinking about what type of VR peripheral, aside from a gamepad, yes. uh, that would be, is that something you guys are consciously thinking about? That is on? our main interest and that's what we're okay. kind of looking at. That's why we're also looking at all these different technologies, trying them out, see what works, what what gets like positive traction with, uh, with game developers as well, stuff like that, to kind of bring our expertise in UI and ergonomics together with what techno where technologies work and, and what game developers want to see and then I kind of bring it all together into a proper, well, raise rise product for VR in the peripheral space. Now speaking of developers, yes. you know, you guys have announced new partnerships, Ubisoft is on board, That's but right. as a game developer, are you choosing are you have, do you have to, if you're developing Unity or Unreal, are you, do you have to choose between working within the APIs of OSVR and Oculus, for no, example? No, absolutely not. I mean, the whole idea of OSVR is that it's as open as possible. So it would be going very much against what we're trying to do here. So there's absolutely zero restrictions with what you do with OSVR. So we generally say, like, if you want to go direct with anyone, feel free to do so. But over and above, um, if you get OSVR, like right now we have 11 different HMDs supported. So with the development effort, which is actually easier than a lot of, of uh, the direct integrations, um, you get a much larger install base from the get-go. And then if over and above you want to go direct with anyone, feel free to do so. But you get that maximum install base and you get that flexibility using OSVR from the get-go. And you're taking into account all the considerations that VR developers want today in terms of tracking, yes. in terms of lens correction, yes. and all, all that stuff. So we just um, just released our distortionizer tool, um, which essentially allows the, the plugin itself to pull information from the HMD that's plugged in. So stuff like field of view, distortion correction, color correction, whatever it is, basically the specifics of the HMD, you can pull them in into the, and then do the stereoscopic video output based on that so that the, the parameters are determined by the HMD developer, and then everything else will work by itself. So as an, now rather than as a content guide to have to worry about how does it look on all of these HMDs, it's on the HMD developer to make sure it looks good on the HMD, whereas the, co the game guy or the content guy can focus on the game sure. itself. Well, thanks so much, Chris, for no telling us about OSVR, and good luck with development kit. We Thank can't you. wait to see that. Come out and see any more games come out for it. I'm Norm from Tested. Will's demoing it right now. We'll have more stuff from GDC 2015 on the site. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, and we'll see you next time. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Okay, Norm, we just had some hands-on time. I think I spent probably a little bit more time than you yep. did. Um, I felt like that first game, the Wipeout, the Wipeout style game, pretty good demo. No, um, what we should be known about these demos is that it's more about how developers can adapt to use HMD than the HMD itself. Right. I mean, the HMD, this is not the consu a consumer product. That's not what they're in the business of doing. Uh, what Chris told me is that they're in the business of making peripherals. They want VR to spread, so when they come out with their VR controller solution, then developers will be primed already in their system. They'll already have APIs, exactly. they'll already have games developed, exactly. all that. So the developers here, they had you know controller-based system, there's a leap motion-based control mm -hmm. system, there's that ring controller system, and I don't know, I don't know about this so far. So the, the big problem that I had in both demos is that there's a massive amount of drift. Yes. Um, because oh, there's yes. no positional tracking, there's a compass in the HMD, but there's no uh, camera, there's no QR codes on the wall, there's no point of reference for outside users. So what happens is over, over, it happened a little bit in the racing game, it happened a lot with the bunny demo. Um, I would just, I'd be facing forward and forward would be over here in the goggles. I have to keep yeah. turning and have to keep turning, have to keep turning. So I really think having that outside point of reference is super important for these things. And while they have a solution for that, a, a couple of solutions it seems like, they weren't demoing them today. Um, I, one thing I do love about their prototype goggles is that you can adjust uh, focus yes. so that people who wear glasses don't have to get contact. Individual eyes. Yeah, and each eye is individual. This was a lot less wobbly than the one that they showed at CES. Mm -hmm. It seemed to hold the position a lot better once you got it set right. It was a little difficult to set the position. I feel like they need some sort of a software step through 
for consumers that'll say, okay, is this in focus, is this in focus? You know, virtual eye exam, as now, it were. And I have no doubt, you know, from a developer standpoint, it's not difficult to implement you know, their OSVR software if you're already working in Unity or in Real Engine. Right. But the question is whether it's going to give you all the tools that another uh, hardware manufacturer, Oculus, for example, gives you already. And Oculus has done the research, They've built in all, all the, their APIs. They, they have three years worth of work on the SDK. Yeah. yeah, and while Chris said, you know, you don't have to choose as a developer, you can work on both. As a developer, you kind of do have to devote your resources in one or the other, and you, or to compound that. So the big question I have is if Razer's not going to make a headset, aside from a dev kit, mm -hmm. and they don't really have hardware partners on board to build headsets yet, why would anybody develop for the platform unless it is just flipping a switch in Unity or flipping a switch in Unreal or, right. or whatever? Um, so, I mean, I, still, I, I came out of this with more questions than I went in. That ring controller is kind of neat. Mm -hmm. um, that's the, that was my takeaway. Yeah. It, it had the same drift problems. This is a hostile 2.4 gigahertz spectrum, and, and that's how that was connected. So, and I mean, it, it, I yeah. have no question, I, no doubt, that regardless of the success of OSVR, they will at some point release this VR gaming peripheral that they're thinking about. because You mean the controller? Company. Some controller yeah. system. So when that comes out, that's when the real test will be. Well, I mean, they released the Hydra. It was the first of the of the real VR controllers, even though it wasn't a particularly good product. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, they, they have the chops to do it. Let's just see. I want to see what happens next. All right, we'll have more from GDC on Tested. We'll see you next time. Bye, guys. Bye.